find the brief order for confession and forgiveness on the first page of your bulletin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God in his mercy has given his son to die for us and for his sake forgives us all our sins as a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ. And by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our hymn number 789.
if we continue at the top of the second page of your bulletin. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let's pray together. Oh God, powerful and compassionate, you shepherd your people, faithfully feeding and protecting us. Heal each of us and make us a whole people that we may embody the justice and peace of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Won't you be seated for the lessons? The first reading is taken from the 23rd book of Jeremiah. Woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, says the Lord. Therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning the shepherds who shepherd my people, it is you who have scattered my flock and have driven them away, and you have not attended to them. So I will attend to you for your evil doings, says the Lord. Then I myself will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the lands where I have driven them, and I will bring them back to their fold, and they shall be fruitful and multiply. I will raise up shepherds over them who will shepherd them, and they shall not fear any longer or be dismayed, nor shall any be missing, says the Lord. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch and he shall reign as king and deal wisely and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will live in safety. And this is the name by which he will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. Here ends the first reading. Second reading is taken from the second book of Ephesians. Remember that at one time, you Gentiles by birth called the uncircumcision by those who are called the circumcision, a physical circumcision made in the flesh by human hands. Remember that you were at that time without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he is our peace. In his flesh, he has made both groups into one and has broken down the dividing wall, that is, the hostility between us. He has abolished the law with its commandments and ordinances that he might create in himself one new humanity in place of the two, thus making peace, and might reconcile both groups to God in one body through the cross thus putting to death that hostility through it. So he came and proclaimed peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him, both of us have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are citizens with the saints and also members of the household of God, built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. In him, the whole structure is joined together and grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are built together spiritually into a dwelling place for God. Here ends the second lesson. <laughs> Gospel according to St. Mark, the sixth chapter. St. Mark writes, the apostles gathered around Jesus and he told them all that they had done and taught. He said to them, come away to a deserted place all by yourselves and rest a while. For many were coming and going and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in a boat to a deserted place by themselves. Now many saw them coming, many saw them going and recognized them. And they hurried there on foot from all the towns and arrived ahead of them. 
as he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. When they had crossed over, they came to land at Gennesaret and moored the boat. When they got out of the boat, people at once recognized him and rushed about that whole region and began to bring the sick on mats to wherever they heard he was and wherever he went, into villages or cities or farms. They laid the sick in the marketplaces and begged him that he might touch even the cloak, the fringe of his cloak, and all who touched it were healed. This is the gospel of the Lord. sit down right here and I have something to show you. What I have is I have a pillow for you and I have a pillow for me. Yeah, and the reason that I have a pillow It's that just what it's about, just for sleep. Because in today's gospel lesson, Jesus tells the apostles that they need to go away and rest for a while. It's a reminder that as busy as Jesus was, and as much as Jesus told the disciples to go and do things, Grandma has nice pillows. <laughs> but it's a reminder that part of what Jesus expects from us is periodically to rest, and to rest to be energized, to be sent out into the world. But it's important to remember that rest also always involves resting in the Word of God. So I pulled these out. These are the prayer books that are sitting down in the rack right downstairs. So Jesus reminds us to rest, but to always rest in the knowledge. Jesus is with us. Do you, do you like taking naps? In your bigger bed. I have to tell you, there is a nap in my future this afternoon. Okay, well, let, let, let's have a prayer together, okay? Can you put your hands together? Yeah, you put your feet on the mat, and then we're going to have a prayer together, okay? Let's, let's pray. Want to put your hands together? You sit right here. Lord, help us to rest, comforted that you are with us. And then when we are well rested, send us into the world to proclaim your name. We pray this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Okay. Thank you for coming up. Let me help you get back to your mom. You, you take the pillow back to your pew. I again invite you to pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So if you look at, at your bulletin and if you look at the gospel lesson, you'll see something that seems a little bit unusual. You know, normally it says gospel according to St. Mark chapter 4 verses 1 to 13 or 5 to 31 or whatever. However, in today's gospel lesson, there's a jump. The lesson jumps from verse 34 to verse 53, which means you're missing verses 35 to 52. You might well ask, well, what's missing from that? Well, what's missing is the narrative of Jesus feeding the 5,000, followed by the disciples taking a boat to the other side of the lake, 
And while the disciples are sailing, Jesus walks on the water to reach the boat. Now these seem like rather important readings. So why does today's gospel lesson skip over those? Well, the reason is because it breaks, those two readings break up a little bit the discussion of the disciples coming back from being sent on a journey. That was earlier in Mark's gospel. That was verses 7 to 13. And the reason that they're taken out is these are all important lessons. The feeding of the 5,000 deserves its own discussion. Walking on water deserves its own discussion. And the disciples returning from having been sent out to the villages, that deserves its own discussion. So that's what's going on. Nothing's trying to be hidden, but in planning the Sunday readings, the committee that planned them is simply trying to help us focus on different things on different Sundays. Okay, so small break on that discussion. We just finished up Vacation Bible School. Wonderful week, 32 kids enrolled, numerous teen helpers, incredible adult staff. And our theme was about Jonah and the whale, but the focus was really on God saving people, including Jonah, and what the kids came to know as the mean people of Nineveh. And God, and Jesus saves us. So along the word, Along the way, we taught the kids some special words that apply to God. Words like grace and mercy, forgiveness and love. Well, another word that we taught the kids comes up in today's gospel lesson, compassion. In verse 34, we read that Jesus had compassion on the people, that is, on the crowds, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. Now, when the Bible talks about sheep without a shepherd, this is a direct indictment of the leadership of the nation. When there were kings ruling over the people, this was an indictment of the king and the king's court. In Jesus' time, this was an indictment of the ruler of Galilee, Herod Antipas, or as we know him here, Herod Jr. This is also an indictment of the ruling Sanhedrin in Jerusalem. Jesus' compassion is what leads Jesus to send out the disciples to preach and heal. Jesus' compassion will lead Jesus to feed the 5,000. We're actually going to have that lesson next week. Jesus' compassion is what has Jesus send the disciples to a quiet place to rest and what leads Jesus to heal the sick, as many as were brought to him. Now, someone asked what the VBS kids learned at VBS. I hope that they will say that they learned that Jesus has compassion for all of us. Now, I think they learned a lot about Jesus, and they learned a lot about Jonah and the whale and the city of Nineveh. But if all they get out of the day was that Jesus has compassion on us, that would be enough. Well, let me move on to our second lesson from the letter to the Ephesians. Help us think about the letter to the Ephesians. Let me use a word that seems to be cropping up more and more in our discussion. That word is tribe. We're using that word more and more because it seems like our nation is dividing into various tribes and the various tribes are having a hard time talking to one another. Now, in Jesus' time, the divide was between the Romans and the Jews. The Jews spoke Hebrew. The Romans spoke Latin. The Jews believed in a God of compassion. The Romans did not believe in one God, but in many gods. The Roman gods were not really filled with compassion for human beings. The Roman gods were really concerned only for themselves. They were greedy and they were capricious. They did whatever felt good to them. And the Romans' god ha gods had no moral code. In fact, the Roman gods did things that we would think were highly immoral, things that would be illegal for a human being to do. The Jews and the Romans seemed to live in two different worlds. 
They worshiped different gods. They lived in different ways. They ate different foods. And in that time and place, people did not change religions. They did not intermarry. They did not visit one another's homes. They did not eat one another's food. And the divisions were not just between the Jews and the Romans. You could throw into that mix the Greeks, the Persians, all the other tribes of humans that just did not mix and did not share. Today we eagerly re repeat these words from the third chapter of St. Paul's letter to the Galatians. Now, we read this morning from Ephesians, but I'm going to quote from Galatians. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. For the early church, in the first decades after Jesus' resurrection, before there was a New Testament, because those books had not been written and collected, during those first decades after Jesus' resurrection, there was a struggle as the first generation of Christians worked to figure out what Jesus meant when Jesus told them to go out into the world and to make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. The fo first followers of Jesus were Jewish. They, from the time they had been little kids, they had been brought up to socialize only with other people who were Jewish. What did Jesus mean, make disciples of all nations? Did that include the Romans? The Greeks? The people in far off Germany? People in Egypt? People lived in what we now call Syria and Arabia. This was a wild thought to invite all these people to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. Today, in 2024, we cannot imagine what a revolutionary thought it was to invite into the church men who are not circumcised. We don't even use the word circumcised in polite company. Certainly we don't ask about anyone's status. But we read in today's second lesson. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off has been, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace. In his flesh he has made both into one and has broken down the dividing wall that is the hostility between us. It took several generations for the early church and the early Christians to welcome both Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians into one church. To see that God calls all people into fellowship with Jesus Christ and with one another. Today, we universally accept that anyone can be a Christian, or at least I hope we universally accept that anyone can be a Christian and can follow Jesus. But there have been bumps along the way. Particularly, this was a problem in the days of slavery not only in the United States, but in other places that had slavery. In some places, it was illegal to teach Christianity to slaves. In others, slaves were given special Bibles that took out anything that might be offensive, such as Moses leading the people of Israel out of their slavery in Egypt. You certainly would not want to suggest to slaves that they could be free in Jesus Christ. In the years after the Civil War, African American Christians would have to build their own churches because they were not welcome in local white churches. We hope that today, among all the various tribes in which our world and nation are divided, all are welcome to follow Jesus. All are welcome in church. We have been united in Jesus Christ. 
We may have different outlooks, different practices, different thoughts. But we are all one in Jesus who has broken down the hostility between all the tribes. Amen. I invite you to rise for our hymn number 611 in your red hymn. Our service continues in the middle of page four of your bulletin with the Apostles' Creed. Together we confess. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He ascended to hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascends from heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Rejoicing that Jesus is risen and love has triumphed over fear, let us pray for the church, the world, and all those in need of good news. for the church of Jesus Christ in this and every land, through the one who is the cornerstone of a firm foundation, join us together and build us up as a temple of mercy and peace. Lord, in your mercy. 
for the creation, caused new trees to be planted, restrained the melting of polar ice caps, saved land from destruction. Like a shepherd tends her sheep, raise up from among us caretakers of all that you have made. Lord, in your mercy, for the leaders of nations and heads of tribes, where peace comes far off, bring it near. Where justice seems fleeting, bring it to light. Where discord seems relentless, bring harmony. Lord, in your mercy. For the health and well-being of family, friends, and neighbors, heal those who are sick. Give courage to all who struggle with addiction. Touch with your tender care all who reach out to you. Lord, in your mercy. God of mercy and love, we place before you all who are today struggling. We remember the many whose names are unknown to us who need your help. We cry for the recent death at our own Bear Creek camp where a camper drowned. We remember all who have recently died and all who have recently lost loved ones. We pray that as a nation we can avoid political violence, political extremism, and the politics of hate. We look to you to send us new faces who can sing and pray with us. Lord, in your mercy. In thanksgiving for those who have died, make us certain that in Christ we are no longer strangers and aliens, but citizens with the saints in the household of God. Lord, in your mercy. Holy God, holy and merciful, into your outstretched arms we commend ourselves and all for whom we pray, trusting in the one who is the way, the truth, and the life, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
I invite you to rise as we turn to the top of page six of your book. Together we pray. God of good gifts, receive these and all our offerings as we present them in faithful service for the sake of your gospel. Prepare our hearts to receive you in this meal as you pour out your very presence through Christ Jesus, the wellspring of eternal life. Amen. It is right and salutary that we should at all times and in all places offer thanks and praise to you, O Lord, Holy Father, through Christ our Lord, who on this day overcame death in the grave and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
I invite you to rise. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you unto everlasting life. Amen. Almighty God, you gave your son both as a sacrifice for sin and a model of the godly life. Enable us to receive him always with thanksgiving and to conform our lives to his through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen. Our hymn number 654. <laughs> 